So I was driving to LA to pick her up. And so once again, I got lost on the 10. I seem to just, the 10 just pulls me into confusion. So I was supposed to be going 10 east. And so after about 20 minutes, I realized I was going 10 west. I started cursing Siri, which I always do. I cursed her. I said, ah, okay, okay. And she actually said, that's not nice one time. <laughs> They've trained Siri well. So uh, at some point, so that was like about, so I was maybe 25 minutes late, <clears throat> and that was like I had actually forgotten that I was going to substitute for Jane Saturday morning and teach, help uh, Brad teach the beginner's course, which was a wonderful class, by the way. Uh, uh, and I think a few, uh, a few people who joined us. It was a wonderful class. and. Um, so it was, I was uh, kind of uh, fran frantic because I uh, had far too many things to do this week. So I'm on the freeway and I'm stuck in that endless traffic. It's sort of like, you know, like, I don't know if that's hell, but it's close to hell as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the 10 in LA, what could be worse than being stuck in the 10? So uh, I'm stuck in the, there and, um, and what did I, what did I think? And I'm sitting there fretting. So does anybody have a clue as to what I thought? I thought, trust in things, not in self. And <clears throat> I'm telling you, it's, it really works. It truly works. It's astounding. It's, uh, I, I've, you know, the Dharma talk is last Sunday, I think, is, was entitled aptly enough, trust in things, not in self. And um, when, you, when you have this moment of like, f when you're feeling very constricted and frantic in any way, you know, like that life is not going the way I need it to go. Blankety, 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 blank. Why are you doing this to me, dear God, or whatever? But when you have these moments where you're really feeling this really uh, constricted, when that comes through to you, that you're really, that there's this self inside that just hates reality the way it is. Just hates it, doesn't want it. And when, or at least for me, when I, when I remember that, trust in things and not in self, it's just like a summer breeze. It's just amazing. So I, I hope you don't get tired of my saying it, but if you do, who cares? <laughs> because I am not gonna forget, I'm not gonna get over saying this to you because it's, a uh, it's extraordinary, extraordinary teaching, but it's like a, a kind of a discovery for me of reading uh, a, something that some en an enlightened being said that made no sense to me for years. I mean, I read that, you know, maybe 10 years ago, and I thought, what the hell does that mean? Trust in things, not in self? You can't trust in self, what can you trust in, you know? So, I mean, I didn't get it at all. And, and, I, uh, and so, uh, since it's like been something that I have sort of like contemplated, it took a very long time for, for my mind to open to the meaning of that. It's not, it's just not intuitive. You don't, you know, I mean, unless you're kind of advanced. I mean, you can be advanced, you really can. I mean, some people are karmically advanced and they just get this stuff. I don't think I'm karmically advanced. So I just have to labor with it. But uh, so trust in things not in self got me just kind of to Kathleen in a pleasant state. So when I arrived in, in, and called her in front of her apartment building, I was not frantic and I was you know, an okay place because I just trusted in that that was what that had to be. But, but it's, not, that's not, it's not the things part that's so important. It's the don't trust in this thing that constantly insists that it has its own way. You know, like, as I told you all last week, the theme song, right, of Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. <laughs> That's the theme song of the ego. I did it my way, right? Not anybody's way, but my way. So um, I uh, urge you to uh, not worry about understanding it. The teachers, the teachers of the old times constantly said, you know, if you try to understand something, you might as well just quit. <laughs> Just forget it, you know. I mean, oh, well, what does that mean when he said, trust in things, not in stuff. Let me go home and ponder that. It has to seep inside. It has to seep into, seep into the pores of your being. And then sometimes, if you're lucky enough, right, 
something awakens to that, to the, to this extraordinary teaching of these enlightened beings. And uh, but as I said, they say it over and over. I think Chanel, whom I'm going to just talk about, he said it's like he was very, he was a, a, a spicy little guy. But he said it's like trying to uh, uh, make rice by boiling sand. Did you ever try to make some rice by boiling sand? <laughs> it won't work. You know. And trying to understand the, uh, the try, try, trying to understand, uh, understand something that is beyond understanding, beyond the intellectual mind's understanding, the thinking mind's understanding. It's a waste of time. It's a complete waste of time. It's like, it's far better to sit and achieve a kind of a silence in the mind. Because that's the only thing that can truly understand anything. As long as you're thinking, as long as I'm thinking, forget it. You know. So, so um, all right. So I just finished that. So I'll, I'll just talk about that next Sunday, the following Sunday, the following Sunday. I'm gonna talk about it forever. The you know the there's there's two or three different translations of it. One, the harsher one, which is it's, it's the same. It's just another translation of the old Chinese. It's, the wise trust in things, not in self. Mister, how does it go? The wise, the wise trust in things, not in self. The stupid never understand that. But you know, I never refer to anybody as stupid, right? I would never say the stupid. The wise trust in things, not in self. The stupid never understand that. That's that's a that's a literal translation of the same passage. So um, I wanted to share with you all. Well, so this is kind of like self-disclosing. <clears throat> I'm ready to. I'm ready to quit talking. So. So this is like I, I, I've not talked about this very much, but. Um, so. I wonder if I think probably I have in my. Checkered career. This little guy's name is Chanel. Have you ever heard me talk about Chanel? Has anybody heard me talk about Chanel? So there you go, Brad has. Um, and he's uh, Korean. And I maybe identify this uh, personality, this uh, little Victor. I perhaps have identified with him more than any other Dharma teacher ever. And I'll explain to you all in a minute why that is, because it's pretty uh, interesting. But it's kind of like by way of also talking a little bit about my own practice. <clears throat> um, um, Chanua was, he, I think he was about, say, like 1158, approximately, in Korea. That's like a few years ago, right? A few years ago. And he, um, I think he shaved, his head was shaved when he was seven. He became uh, a, a, a novice monk at maybe 15. And you know, uh, and the history of Korea at that, uh, of Korea at that time is just astonishing. China was even then was you know, like the dominant nation, and so, you know, and the re Korea was eventually divided into three kingdoms, three uh, uh, kings, and Buddhism was uh, uh, had spread into uh, Korea really like about 300 A.D. It was already in Korea, and by really about five by the, by the time uh, uh, Chinua was born. Uh, like uh, the royal, the royal family, right, had embraced Buddhism, but um, so the reason why I, I'm so so if you go to a Zen center now in Korea, if you go to a Zen uh, monastery, one of their mountain monasteries, this guy is going to be maybe almost the most important uh, uh, master that they study. They study his teaching, so I mean he's a major, major, major deal, and uh, he has like. Uh, one one uh, thing that he wrote called Secrets of Cultivating the Mind is almost like a standard thing that is taught in, in the Korean monastery. And and by the way, those for most people, I mean, like if you're talking about Japan or Korea, I mean, Korean Buddhism is pretty hardcore. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you go to one of those places, there's someone who told, uh, who went to a Korean master who was touring in, um, a very famous guy, he was touring in America about 15 years ago, and I knew this person who went up to me and he said, 
sir, you knew about. He said, I would like to come and sit in your monastery. Could I come and sit with you? And the teacher said, sure, if you're be prepared to die. <laughs> if you're willing to die, you're welcome to come. So let's see how many of us would raise our hand. <laughs> so what does that mean, you know, that you're willing to die? So uh, Chinua, I love Chinua because uh, for one reason, I guess he was a... Um, well, I was, he, he was, he was um, very, very serious about his Dharma study, but he never had a, a famous teacher. Everybody, all of the famous uh, Zen, uh, uh, the lineage all the way from Bodhi Dharma down, generation after generation after generation, everybody had an enlightened teacher. And then, uh, then they were became the student of that teacher, and then there was called what you call transmission, and so then then the stamp of approval was given onto them, and so then they they were in line. And we're talking like for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And so, like one of the things that you did back then, like in Korea, you always went to China. That's sort of like that's that was the big leagues, right? I mean, if you were in the like sort of like podunk in Korea, right? So you always went to China to study with a great master, and so like. Dogen in Japan, uh, who is the originator of uh, Soto Zen, he went to China to study with a great master. Everyone did. He didn't. Chanel didn't. He didn't. So he didn't. And so the basically in his biography, the, it is said, and now you understand why I like him so much. It is said that he achieved a lot enlightenment through the study of the Dharma. Through the study of the Dharma. Uh, he didn't achieve it through some great master who, you know, gave him koans. He did it with his relentless study. And, and it's very fascinating because uh, he was most inspired by um, a Chinese master named Wei Nung, who, um, and I've always loved the story of, this is for the same reason, Wei Nung was this little guy who was illiterate, and he was like uh, in uh, China, in Canton, I think, and he was walking in, he sold wood in his, on the street, and the story is, right, he walked into a shop and he heard a monk uh, uh, chanting the Diamond Sutra. And the story is his mind awakened. He had an enlightened experience hearing the Diamond Sutra. Well, you know, so like, again, that's kind of like, wow. So Chano loved, and now go back from Wei Nong, go back like almost 600 years later. Wei Nong is that much earlier. He's like in like the 600s. Now go to, to Chano. And Chanel loved uh, Wei Nong, and apparently he read some of the sutras of Wei Nong, and he his mind open was uh, uh, enlightened. So the story of Chanel is uh, Chanel is, is that he had three major experiences of awakening, all three from reading the scriptures of enlightened beings. This is what I have done for the past twenty five years. I didn't say that I have awakened three times. <laughs> I have not awakened three times in the past 25 years. But I have relentlessly read these teachers for 25 years. And it's the only thing that is interesting to me. You know, it's like basically I can get a little bit into Carl Jung, you know, as you know I can see. But basically I read these, teacher, these teachers. They're amazing. And, and it it's a, it sort of startles me because it's second nature to me. I mean, it's probably if you take Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, there are other days. I mean, Victor's probably reading one of those people. Bodhidharma, Wei Nong, Chanu. I'm reading them. They, they did the work. They did the work, right? And, and, and when they write, they're writing from some place that's just absolutely, totally clear. So, uh, and that, that's the only way that I can, uh, well, it seems the way that I connect mostly, and it keeps me uh, on the straight and narrow, I suppose, because as I said, so trust in mind, not in things, that's, how did I get that? I read, I found the, you know, this, the, the translation of Bodhidharma. Dharma. And as I told you all, uh, I, you know, everyone knows that famous story when I was in Nepal and stuck in the airport and at, 5 a.m. the airport was closed but I mean just I mean that teaching came to me and it was like astounding I mean it was amazing I thought, oh my god 
I never, there's just words. And then suddenly it becomes living, it, it has living meaning. So I wanted to just share with you all a little bit of, you know, uh, we're going to do, uh, when we do uh, our, we're gonna have an all day retreat in Pasadena at the, in September, and I'm gonna base it, and I've titled it, as I told Travis, I'm gonna call it Tracing Back the Radiance, which I love. Does that, does that kind of like have a ring to it, Tracing Back the Radiance? That's his expression of our practice, Tracing Back the Radiance. And um, so uh, I want to just read you a few, uh, just give you a flavor of Chanel, okay? It, do, do you mind? If you don't want me to, I won't. That was a joke. <laughs> I mean, you know I would do it regardless of whether you're wanting me to or not. And um, so I want to give you a flavor of that. And I, I wanted to, I mean, actually even, I started thinking, I, I started uh, to even talk about that before we sat today, talking as we sat, the idea of tracing back the radiance. And um, because it's certainly a practice that, uh, has been extremely valuable for me, and uh, so and I, and I'm going to talk more about it as we go uh, along. And it's like I say, I, th I would really, I think that we're going to maybe kind of focus that all-day retreat in Pasadena on on what it means to try to trace the radiance back. Where are you where are you tracing it? So let me just ask you before I read <clears throat> this guy, this wonderful, wonderful little man. I mean, he was quite amazing. Do you think that you have any radiance? Close your eyes. I really do. I to, please close your eyes. Just for a moment. I'm doing the same thing. And I would ask you, is there any radiance in the mind? So, you can open your eyes. Is there any radiance? Is there any radiance about your mind? I mean, can you experience radiance in the mind, in awareness? <clears throat> the quieter your mind is, the, 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 less, the less your mind is filled with thoughts, right? So that the thoughts are interrupting any experience of the mind. You would, the more you would feel or you would experience a radiance in the mind. And according to, uh, to know, and as, again, as I say, I mean, it's like, I mean, he gets, he gets like the Academy Award just for coming up with the phrase, tracing back the radiance, in my opinion. But, but uh, the, the quieter you are, you are able to begin to connect to radiance in aware, awareness as a radiance, right? The more you can experience that. You can't experience that if you are uh, disconnected from that and you're, experience, you're connected to uh, personality that thinks it's not the mind. You know, it's it's my way. I did it my way. Right. That part of me that says I did it my way is not really that available to experience you know, luminous uh, awareness. So uh, so you could say that some of some technique that we do in mind whatever our mindfulness techniques to some extent it's all a preliminary attempt to to get the mind still and empty so so that it can experience reality. Now. Because of our karma, because of our you know eons of of, of you know of ha you know the generations of of our mind uh, being absolutely filled with uh, I am me, I am this, I want this, I want that, I want that for you, I don't like you, I can't stand you. Well, I kind of like you. I mean, it's just endless, right? So where's the where's the space inside to experience the reality of what is inside? If the mind is so, you know, completely frantic, you know, what am I going to do tomorrow? I don't have enough money. I have too much money. Well, I'd like to, you know, it's like it just it's endless. So, uh, to some extent, you know, I mean, it's as simple as you, you know, to put it on this level. But this stuff is beyond what we, what, the, what our practice is. This is like, sort of like the big leagues, as I'll explain in a minute. But, but I mean, but, but, but you call it down to just this basic practice. Why are you watching the breath, the breath at the nostrils? Why the hell are you doing that? 
That's not going to bring you to enlightenment or me to enlightenment. Well, it did me, but not you. Uh, so, no, right? I mean, why are we watching our nose, right? Why are you watching our breath over and over and over and over? Oh, God. Right? Or struggling with watching the rise and the fall of the belly, right? Rising and falling, rising and falling, which is a great, a great technique. Mindfulness to eating. Mindfulness to... Why are we doing that? I mean... Uh, it's like, and again, you remember that I said again what he said about, um, right? Uh, it, that's that's going to work as much as uh, trying to uh, make rice by boiling sand. That's not really going to lead us to uh, awakening, the mind opening. That you know, the Buddha, it's not going to lead us to that. It's going to lead us to uh, a, the, a technique of, of more inner control, which is a wonderful thing, but. But, but the ultimate thing is it's just leading to this uh, uh, state or place where the mind begins to be like a still forest pool, right? Where it becomes calm and where you can begin to see the bottom. That's what uh, Achan Sa said, Charles said, right? He said when the, a pool, a forest pool becomes so still and, you know, that the, ray, the little ripple stuff, then you can see through, it's clear and you can see through to the bottom. So that's exactly a, a good analogy for what all of these techniques are about. They're about, you know, training the mind to uh, let go of thought. But the, I, but the ultimate aim is for the awareness to, to develop, right? The, the awareness in the mind, because the awareness is what sees the truth. It's the only thing that sees the truth, other than the awareness. We're just stuck again with this this little mind that thinks it can, you know, it's like I loved, I used to use the expression, you can't think your way out of a paper bag. I used to say that unkindly. <laughs> but we can't think our way out of a paper bag. We can't think our way out of anything. So uh, the technique really is that, and we have to sort of let that go. And so <clears throat> these people are, are constantly talking about, and so they have this expression, I think I said this, they have this expression in, uh, in the old Chinese that your goal is thoughtlessness. Thoughtlessness. Well, that sounds like a little bit of a contradiction to mindfulness, doesn't it? Thoughtlessness. You know, and then we would say, he was so thoughtless. And we have that as like as a pejorative. That doesn't sound like a very good thing. But what they're describing is this tech, this, this awareness that is so powerful that it, it eventually is that it sees the thought the minute it pops up. And then they describe it as like a snowflake hitting a fire. A thought melts instantly in the presence of prajna. You cannot, you cannot hold on to a thought in the presence of awareness. It's not possible. So, how to keep thinking? Just don't develop your awareness. It's a simple thing, right? If you want to just keep on thinking and thinking and thinking, if I do, just don't develop awareness. But, but the process of developing, it's called prajna, Prajna is what is the son, or the Pali word or the Sanskrit word too for uh, uh, wisdom, but they're what they're talking about is awareness, developing this awareness. So Chanel says, you know, he says, don't be upset about thinking, having a thought. He says, be upset about being late in seeing it. Right? Don't be upset about any thought that comes into your mind. Just be a little bit concerned about the fact that you're tardy on the awareness. You know, because if you're tardy on the awareness and you have a thought, what the hell am I doing stuck on this freeway? Okay, so you're tardy. I mean, you're 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 tardy with that, and you have this thought. Where am I going to go? I hate myself, <laughs> or something awful, right? Or life is hopeless. What's the point of living? I mean, we could just go that bad, but whatever it is, that sec the, the 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 thought that links to the second thought is your conditioning. I mean, your default system, you know, I'm unworthy or I'm too worthy. It doesn't matter what your system is, right? But, I mean, all of our psychological stuff, all of it comes on the second thought, not the first thought. The first thought might rather be, you know, really, really, I'm not happy. Or, it doesn't matter what your first thought is. I'm a piece of shit. That's the first thought. I am a piece of shit. If my awareness is not tardy and it goes right with it, that vanishes. It's gone. It's not like it lingers in my body. It's gone. It's a silence. So what's left if there's no thought? 
What is left with you this moment if there's no thought in your head? So Janelle says four things are left. And, um, and he's just, well, what really is left, I mean, it's like the Buddha is left. Well, that's kind of serious. I should not accuse you of being a Buddha, should I? Excuse me, I should never do that. What is left if there's no thought is emptiness, calmness, and, and, the, and numinous is the, the word he uses. Numinous is a great word. Does, does anyone know what numinous means? It sort of like means the sacred, right? The numinous is, you know, like it's the is like the the is, uh, the sacred or even like the divine, uh, the numinosity. But 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 in, in other words, the mind, the, the the sacred part of the mind, the part that is incapable of uh, that is capable of touching or connecting to the all is is the numinous. But anyway. The, the empty, the calm, the numinous awareness. That's what we're left with. That sounds pretty bad to me. Doesn't that sound bad to you, Beverly? I don't want to be left with like this numinous illum uh, radiance in the mind. So uh, that's what is left Every moment after a thought in the space of silence is, is that emptiness and awareness. And, and, and according to Chano, the awareness in you has never been interrupted since the day you were born. It's not like your awareness comes and goes, right? Is anybody here aware, of, not aware of this moment? I mean, do you have like a space of that? Right, right? Well, I'm not aware, right? Where, where, where does awareness go? It never goes. It's never born or it never dies. So when we sat for 45 minutes, your awareness was never absent. It was never absent. Your, uh, we, can, we can get sleepy and we can, we can slide out of it. I mean, if you go to sleep at night, your awareness is still there, even though you know, your ego it goes to sleep and unconscious. But you have a dream and you're even, like some people have a luminous dream. I mean, right? I mean, they're aware. What is it called? Not a luminous dream, a lucid dream. But I mean, some people are even aware of the dream as they dream. Other people are not. But it's still, I mean, the awareness never goes. It never, it's never gone. So uh, that's the whole thing about that not, uh, that thoughtlessness, that word that they use, that we, that we don't even particularly like in, in the West. It's kind of like a little bit of a pejorative, right? But they, they talk about, uh, I mean, the, the Chan in China and, the, and, and also in Japan, they talk about the thoughtlessness as that mind that is exactly the mind that we, t we studied two weeks ago, right? The way is not difficult if you just give up preferences, right? And then it said, give up cherishing opinions, give up loving and hating, all of those, all of those, the, the, the duality. Right, all all of this, the, uh, the right and the left, the good and the bad, that mind that gives that up is a thoughtless mind, meaning that it is not filled with thoughts about this is good and that is bad. So, uh, all right, I'm, I'm not going to read this. I'm ready to read this now. Are you ready for me to read this? Ready. <laughs> is anybody bored? I am. Norman, are you bored? I'm a, just, just, a little. just a little. <laughs> I'll try to ratchet it up and try to be a little bit more interesting, right? Maybe I can see if I can modulate my voice differently, right? But like a little bit more of a southern accent. More? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> see, I should never leave an opening with him. I learned a long time ago, like you, there are some people you don't leave an opening, right? You just keep it going. Norman's not saying, if you give him like a, a little moment, he's in, like Flynn. It's tragic, he says. People have been deluded for so long. They do not recognize that their, all, their own minds are the Buddha. Well, right off the bat, <laughs> has anybody recognized that your own mind is the Buddha? You know, He says, we don't recognize that. They do not recognize that their own nature is the true Dharma. They want to search for the Dharma yet they still look far away for holy ones. You know, we go to the great teachers or go to India, go to Japan. So we're looking outside ourselves for the Dharma and for the Buddha. 
They want to search for the Buddha, yet they will not observe their own minds. If they aspire to the path of Buddhahood, while obstinately holding to their feeling that the Buddha is outside the mind or the Dharma, is outside the nature, then, and then this is really kind of like extraordinary, it's kind of like he's, he goes a little hyperbole. I guess that's why I like him. Even though they pass through kalpas of as numerous as dust motes, burning their bodies, charring their arms, crushing their bones, exposing their marrow, or writing uh, sutras with their own blood. Some, all of this stuff is like the ascetic practices these people did right in India. And, and, and right, they did these things. All these things. I mean, there's this story about, you know, like the uh, Waka cutting off his arm, for God's sake. But they did these extraordinary ascetic practices to, to, in, to become enlightened. So he says, you know, you could do all of that, never lying down to sleep, eating only one time a day at the hour of, you know, the hare, which is five to seven, or studying through the entire Tripitaka and cultivating all sorts of ascetic practices, it's like trying to make rice like boiling sand. That's where the expression comes from. He says, I mean, in other words, you can, re you can read everything, you can do it, but it doesn't change anything as long as you're looking for the Buddha outside your own mind. And the idea of being able to embrace that reality is, I mean, it is one of the mysteries of my life. I am endlessly uh, surprised by how hard it is for us to embrace this, the fact that it is our own mind. It's your own mind, stupid. I think I said that a while ago. That w The way we deny that reality of the luminous awareness uh, that, you know, because, because for some strange reason we have so identified with a self a me a personality and it is convinced it is not the mind i mean it's just like a mystery to me but it is so anyway so he says it's like boiling if you all got that so um he said if people would only understand their own minds then, without searching, approaches to the Dharma as numerous as the sands of the Ganges and unaccountable sublime meanings would all be understood. If we only understood our mind, we would understand everything, every single thing that needs to be understood here. Right? If we only understood this. And why is it that we are so relentlessly opposed to understanding our own mind? That's like your like Cohen, I think. <laughs> I don't necessarily think that there's an answer to that. Uh, I I definitely well, I guess I have an answer. Uh, all right, and then um, so the, the next thing I wanted to read you is this kind of I I love this and uh, this is kind of fun. So this is the flavor of Chanel, and uh, I, uh, as you all know, I have I, have I made it clear that I like him. So I want you to, I just want to, this is a really kind of very simple, but I just want you all to maybe get the flavor of this. Now, in China and in Korea and in Japan, one of the things that you all, let's just pretend that Cheryl is sitting there. So everybody would do this to their, great, to their teachers. I mean, it's like, and let's just pretend that I am a great teacher, okay? So Cheryl comes to me and she says, Victor, what is the Buddha? So the teacher says, your name is Cheryl. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, the first is, well, you know, you know, they don't know what the hell, you know. So then Brandon says, well, what is the Buddha? So right, the teacher looks and says, your name is Brandon, you know. And, you know, we shy away from that immediately, right? I mean, like, well, what does that mean? But it's really clear, you know, what, the, what they are saying. They're saying you are the Buddha. You just cannot embrace that. It, it's like, it, it seems almost impossible for us to embrace that truth. So anyway, uh, he's talking about, um, he says, so he, how does he say this? He says, uh, in, in case you cannot accept this, that you are the Buddha, Robert, in case you cannot accept it, he says, um, I will mention some of the events surrounding a few of the ancient saints' entrance onto the path. Just uh, this should allow you to resolve your doubts. I really, I mean, he's very funny. And by the way, there's one of the things that you know about Chanel is that he constantly uh, references every major Zen teacher in China, right? I mean, I mean, this book is just 
it's almost like a, 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 a one resource to just reading all of these. He, re, he quotes every one of them, right? So that's, I think there's a syncretic, maybe is the word that you use, syncretic. I think that he, that's his, his mind uh, 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 synchronizes, I don't know what the word is, but anyway, he, he, he pulls together all of these various uh, traditions into his own belief. And actually, at, at the point of his, of, of his uh, practice, in, in like the 12th century, there was like there were four uh, very intensely competing schools, and he basically kind of like pulled them all together. So anyway, this is a famous king who uh, um, asked uh, a monk, the venerable Bharati. So I want you all to just sort of like put yourself in the practice of this, and sort of like because it's kind of it's very charming and it's like also very profound. I mean, you can kind of really get it. If you could just imagine yourself as a king, right, asking this question of this old monk, right? So he said, what is Buddha? That's a good question. What is Buddha? So the venerable monk said, seeing the nature is Buddha. So the king asked, well, has the master seen the nature yet or not? The master, the, the monk. And so the no, old venerable monk said, yes, I have seen the Buddha nature. So then the king said, well, where is the Buddha nature? Where is it if you've seen it? Huh? So the monk said, this nature is present during the performance of actions. This nature is present during the performance of actions. So the king said, during what performance of actions? Hmm? He says, I can't see the Buddha nature right now in any performance of actions, right? So uh, I, um, well, anyway, so I, I'm just imagining you know, what, the, what his old teacher was kind of, he probably was smiling. I can't see the, in the Buddha nature in the performance. Can anyone see the Buddha in the performance of any actions as you're sitting here? Do you see the any performance of any Buddha action? Does anyone see the performance of any Buddha action? As we as you're wiggling your foot, sure. So the old monk says, it appears in this pre present performance of action, your majesty, Unfortunately, you just don't see it. So the king said, but do I have it too or not? And so he says, if your majesty performs actions, there are none in which they are not present. If your maj majesty were not acting, in its essence would be very difficult to see. Now, as we're sitting in meditation and sitting very still, it's very difficult to, to, to have that awareness of seeing really the essence of the mind because there's not much action going on. And so I, I parenthetically just have to, this was something I was going to begin. I was going to say this in the beginning <laughs> and then we're at the end. So, so one of the things that I love about teaching walking meditation, I love teaching walk, walking meditation to invite people to be aware of what it is that's lifting the foot. <clears throat> What is it that causes that to happen? You could look and say, what do you think when you say so? I say, what, what causes that? What causes that to happen when you're doing walking meditation? Well, you, you cause that to happen, Victor, right? If you thought that, right? It's the mind, stupid, right? It's the mind. And of course, they say the mind is the Buddha. If, what is causing you to sit? What is keeping your body erect this moment? Why is your body not falling over, right? It's the mind. The mind is signaling the body to, do, to be in, in really a good posture this moment, right? Well, it is. But, but you're, everything that, every way that you're sitting is only because your mind is in that configuration, right? Your mind is do, doing that. Hmm? So, uh, so he says, if you really are looking, the, the, the guy is texting the king, and say, if you're really looking at a person's actions, you can see, right, in any action that the mind is what caused that action to happen, right? So uh, the king says, well, would you describe, he said, so he said, well, when one acts, 
So this is kind of like an old. This is kind of like an old thing. You see this in many different things. It's really not important. He says, if when if, if one asks how many different places does do you see it acting, right? And so, uh, the, uh, the the monk says it, it appears in eight places, <clears throat> eight places only. And so he says, in the womb, it's called a fetus. Uh, some people, some translations of that word fetus are spirit, by the way. I mean, this translation, it's, it's called, uh, in the womb, it's, a, it's, it's called a, a fetus. It's, but I have read it before, it's in the womb, it's called a spirit. In the, in the womb, it's called a fetus. On being born, it's called a person. In the eyes, it's called seeing. And in the ears, it's called hearing. In the nose, it smells. In the tongue, it talks. In the hands, it grasps. And in the feet, it runs. When it is expanded, it, when it's expanded, it contains worlds as numerous as grains of sand. When it is compressed, it exists within one minute particle of dust. Those who have recognized it know that it is the Buddha nature. So, um, the the teaching of uh, Chanel, but all of these teachers, they're relentlessly asking you to become aware of the mind itself, awareness, right? even to watch. And sometimes I find myself, you know, I try to do this at home, right? Sometimes I will say, okay, I'm going to do it. So I'll watch that thought that comes in the mind go to the kitchen. Right? I mean, it will feel like you're going to the kitchen. It's just a natural thing, right? You go to the kitchen to make a cup of coffee, right? And then you're not, that's that's not the end of it. Then you will then the mind will tell you to do something else. Oh no, well, not, go to the bathroom or go to this and this. So but if but if you're watching, if you're relentlessly trying to watch the mind, right, you will you begin to see that we are every single thing we do is a thought. Every single thing comes from an initial thought in the mind, right? And basically it's coming from the personality. It's not coming from emptiness. Do you think that empty awareness would say, go to the kitchen and have a cup of coffee? Does any, if, if someone thinks that, when, when would empty awareness tell you to go to the kitchen and have a cup of coffee? It would be trust in self, not in things. It's self. It's this little self, conditioned self, which, which is, God bless it, it's not a bad thing, but it's not this l empty, luminous awareness. It's not that. So to, to be interested in watching that, watching the thoughts that endlessly come over and over and over and keep us, I mean, we just, our little bodies don't stop, right? I mean, we're, our, that, that, that thought is just moving us constantly to do this and that. It's astounding. And then when you begin to watch it, I mean, then suddenly, if you really are watching it, sometimes you can have that thought, you know, get up now and turn on the TV. And then basically, you know, if it's awareness, just, oh, oh. You won't. You maybe you will just sit and be quiet. If you won't even do it. So, uh, all right, that's all. I think I wanted to read. I am going to read this. I just love this. So, I, uh, you excuse me for going over. I don't really care, but I say that because I try to pretend like I'm a nice person. There's <laughs> these. All these guys. They're just. They're just wonderful. I mean, they're just wonderful. And I mean, I feel. I, I really do mean this when I say this. I feel kind of sorry that so many. Uh, people do not uh, uh, take advantage of uh, these wonderful teachers. This is a little guy that, I mean, his teacher, uh, this is a monk um, from Japan, and I think his teacher took him to America. I mean, this is a true story. I mean, it's, I mean, it's kind of like in the 30s. He wanted him to start spreading Zen in, the, in California. I think he took him to Los Angeles. He just left him on the street with a suitcase and said, now you're on your own. <laughs> he didn't speak English. The little guy didn't speak English. He stayed there, and I think he worked. He, he would, I think he tried to get a job driving a taxi, but he couldn't speak. And they said you know, the story was, you know, he didn't last very long at that. I think his teacher left him twenty dollars. He stood there with his little, old, you know, little suitcase. So, uh, so the um, he died. Uh, maybe anyway. So I think he started teaching. He started a whole thing of Zen in in L.A. and died not. You know, maybe maybe about. Uh, I think he taught for about forty years. He had many many students. I love this, and so I'm going to share this with you all because it's like it, it, you get a flavor of him. Be before he died, he wanted he had his he wanted to tape a message to his students. 
right? So after he died and they all came to a memorial service, it was play, they played his, right, his little message. So he said, friends in the Dharma, be satisfied with your own heads. So I love that. I just love that. Be satisfied with your own heads. Now, I, that relates to me to Chanel, right? I mean, like, again, exploring what is the mind. But he says, be satisfied with your own heads. And so then he said, do not put on false heads over your own. Don't put false heads on over your own. That would be like, you know, this, your personality, you know, this person, that person. Just be satisfied with your own basic head, right? And he said, then minute after minute, uh, watch your step closely, mindfulness. And, and then he said, these are my last words to you. And then he kept talking. <laughs> I just <laughs> He didn't really, he said, these are my last words to you. And then there's a pause. And then he said, each head of yours. <laughs> and this is very typical of who he was. Apparently, he could never stop talking. He said, now, this is just wonderful. He said, each head of yours is the noblest thing in the whole universe. Who believes that, Rob? Who believes that? Each head of yours is the noblest thing in the universe. Imagine if you could embrace that as the truth. No God, no Buddha, no sage, no master can reign over it. And then this is my favorite sentence. He said, Rinzai said, Rinzai is the, one of the greatest Chinese teachers. I think it was called Lin Chi in Chinese. If you master your own situation, wherever you stand is the land of truth. So then he says, just as he ends, he says, keep your head cool. Right, uh, uh, Senzaki says, keep your head cool, but your feet warm. Do not let sediment sweep over your feet. Well-trained Zen students should breathe with their feet, not with their lungs. This means that you should forget your lungs and only be conscious of your feet while breathing. The head is the sacred part of your body. Let it do its own work, but don't make any monkey business. <laughs> and that's the thing. I love his statement that your head is the most sacred part. So that's all I have to say. Was that, that was long. <laughs>